Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Let's Process That podcast. I'm Emily Christopher. And I'm Nick Honorkamp. And we welcome you back. Season two, episode two. Um, we got some things to dive into. So without further ado, welcome. We are tackling a topic today that Nick and I have a lot of experience in, and I think can hopefully help a few people because, um, again, this has been a reoccurring, um, topic or issue that's been brought up. And so we want to be able to speak to it, um, through our point of view, through our experience with it. And that is battling perfectionism. When is enough enough? When is, what is good enough? How do we take on this? Um, and so we're going to dive right in. I'm going to toss it to Nick and we're going to see where this party gets started. So Nick, thoughts on perfectionism. Oh, help me, Lord, help me. Well, it's funny because I was like, okay, this will be good. I'll just play off Emily. And then she dishes it to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but that's part of what we do. So even though you and I have a ton of experience in this area, it doesn't mean we're experts. That's right. for sure. And that's the whole premise of this podcast is nobody here is an expert. We are processing out loud some things people want to talk about. And one of the uh, things that's come up several times is people are like, man, how do you deal with perfectionism? And so let's, I, I guess I'd back up just a little bit and say, you know, where's that perfectionism coming from? And I know for me, I have plenty of self-talk, plenty of self-drive that I don't need anyone to tell me whether it was good enough or not good enough. You know, there's no one forcing me to try to be, do it perfectly, but me. So there's probably three voices I have in my head that drives that. Number one is what I expect of myself. Um, Obviously, you know, there's many times there's no one even looking, and yet I care. I'm paying attention. Uh, Number two, there are some people in my head. There's a mom. There's a dad. There's a pastor. There's some people who, you know, if you don't have time to to do it twice, you don't have time. You don't have time to do it wrong. You got to do it right the first time or. Or is that really your best? And then, you know, you and I come out of Christianity and out of religious traditions that to live up to those standards, you have to be perfect and it's not possible. And so we've had to learn how to try to live up to standards that we were unable to uh, meet that standard. And yet we believe it be correct. So we tried and we did the best we could and you go from there. Um, my son, Caleb, is a producer of sort with music, and he always says this to me. He says, Dad, I have all these people that want to get a song out, and we'll do the work. And I'm like, let's get it out in the marketplace. Let's get some feedback. And they're like, no, 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 it's not perfect. And they'll take it again, and they'll work on it for another month, and another month, and another month. He said, I can't tell you how many projects, good projects, never make it to the marketplace because the artist refuses to put it in the public eye and let it speak to it. Mm-hmm. And whether that's insecurity or whether they think this one song is their best song they're ever going to write and they have to get it perfect. And he's he's been one who has taught me, make your best first shot at it and then get it out there. You'll get feedback. You'll get correction. The marketplace mm-hmm. will speak to you. You can make adjustments on this song or on your next song, but you got to get it out there. And so I think more than anything, before we even talk about standards of excellence, I think is what drives us to think that something has to be perfect before we let it go. And I think that there's some really ugly negative self-talk. And I'll talk about performance mentality in a second, but I think there's a lot of negative self-talk that's keeping us uh, on that treadmill of it's got to be better, it's got to be better. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Oh, yeah. Well, so when this topic was kind of brought up to us and and we knew we were going to speak on it, of course, I went back and looked at through my Brene Brown notes. (laughs) And it was talking about how um, perfectionism is really self-protection because we are afraid of failure. We're afraid to be rejected. And so We think if I can get this perfect or if I'm perfect, that those fears won't manifest themselves. And so that leads into, you know, what, what voice you're listening to, which is yourself just reiterating, because you know, your, your biggest fears and your rejection trigger points or whatever it may be, um, where you just buckle 
under the weight of that. And so I would even start, yes, it's the negative self-talk, but also having to take a step back and being like, this is my rejection, my shame, my abandonment speaking. Yeah. To me. Yeah. And and how many times do we think we have value when we produce value? Mm-hmm. And if we don't produce value, then we don't have any value at all. And therefore, if we produce and it's not good, it's more about not what we did, but who we are. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh. Yes, absolutely. That that whole being defined by what we do, I think, runs a lot of people's lives. Um, yeah. They get so bogged down that if I didn't produce something excellent and wonderful and perfect, then what am I? Because they let that define everything about them. And that's a really dark and scary place if that's all your life boils down to. Absolutely. What's fascinating to me is in the book that I just finished, I sent it to the editor twice. After the editor, you have to send it through three rounds of proofreading. So the first proofreader fixes all the mistakes, kicks it back to me. I accept I accept the changes, send it to the second proofer, knowing she ain't going to find nothing. And she comes back with 50 to 75 more critiques. And then I fix that and I send it off again and they send it back with another 50. And you're just like, is a proofreader not doing their job? Of course they are. But a proofreader is doing it through their lens. And mm-hmm. and if you give it to a different proofreader, they're going to want have certain preferences. And what I've learned is there's very, if you're shooting for perfection, you're never going to get it right. Right. You shoot, you shoot for a great product and that you don't have anything glaring that pulls away from it that keeps the reader from enjoying it. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that proofreading really helped me that, you know, you're never going to get grammar a thousand percent correct. There's different points of view on how to use grammar, what words to use in certain sentences. And so I, I really appreciated that because I didn't feel like a failure because they found 50 more mistakes. I was delighted but that it didn't go to press before they found those mistakes. And But I could see where someone, let's say a songwriter writes a song and someone looks at it and sends it back with a bunch of critique. Gosh, doesn't, doesn't that feel awful personal to, to an artist? Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh, yes. Even, I mean, if we want to dive into like the creative space of writers and artists and all this kind of stuff, like when you write or create something, it is a part of you. Mm-hmm. And most creatives are very much feelers and highly emotional people. And so whenever you share your baby with someone or the world and they're like, oh, I didn't like it or that's trash or whatever. I mean, you are deeply wounded and that can keep you from creating further. It can yeah. keep you from doing that again. Um, or it could throw you into a perfection like cycle where you just got, I got, I can't let anyone see this ever again, or I can't show the world this until I think it's perfect. And that's the whole thing. Everything is subjective. Mm -hmm. Like definitely art, writing, any music, et cetera. But honestly, everything is food, comedy. It doesn't matter what it is. You're not going to be everyone's cup of tea. And that's a real hard pill to swallow sometimes because I want everybody Mm -hmm. to like me. But once I had to shoot, yeah, can't imagine why not. Um, But it was a hard pill to swallow and finally get over that, like, I'm not everybody's favorite thing. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. I am going to be too much for some people, but that shouldn't hold me back from being completely who I am and for creating and taking risk and making something for the world. Um, But it is so terrifying to step into that place and have your rejection and shame just blaring in your ears. It's Mm. almost deafening and it can take away from you being creative a hundred percent. There's no telling how many people have quit um, because shame and rejection or judgment has completely squashed that for them. Yeah. And and this happened this week. Um, As you know, my wife, Tina is an artist and she took, she takes pictures of wildlife and then she paints. And the other day I asked her a question and she was showing me a, a painting that she had done. And I said, as an artist, when do you know when it's done? How, how do you know when the painting is good, when it's finished? And she says, when I love it, 
when it matches what I saw in my mind. When I took the photograph, there was some some brilliance and beauty captured in that photograph, and I try to not repaint the squirrel or the chipmunk or the elk or the whatever. I'm trying to repaint that magical moment, and when I see on the on the canvas what I saw on the camera, it's enough. And I'm like, gosh, but nobody else saw that. So everybody else critiques the painting based on their view, their limited information, their lack of experience as an artist. And yet only the artist knows what they saw mm -hmm. and what they're trying to replicate. And I thought that was fascinating. That That's one clue to when is enough enough. Well, it matches what I saw and what I felt internally and I was able to capture it, and I don't, I don't really care if you like it or don't like it. I got it where it needed to go. I thought that was, I thought that was helpful. Oh, that's brilliant! Yeah, and that shows so much confidence again in herself. And this echoes from just the last podcast. Even we're kind of building on that. When you have enough self confidence and you believe in yourself, you you get to say when you get to call the shots. I get to sure. say when, and when yeah. I love it, that is enough. Um, it didn't have to be perfect for anyone else. Um, I heard a story, gosh, pretty recently, and I think this was at the University of Florida, I think. I need to go back and see if I can find it. But there was um, a professor who had a photography class, and he said, he, half of you go to this side of the room, the other half, you know, go to this side. All right, on the left side, you are going to be graded on the quantity of photos you take this semester. So if you take 100 photos, edit them, do everything, you'll get an A. If you do 90, you're going to be. All right, the right side, you are going to submit one photo, your very best photo, the perfect photo, and then you'll be graded on that. Well, these students spend all semester working on um, their final project. And when they were submitted, it turned out that the ones that had the one photo were actually mediocre compared to the ones who did a lot of photos. And the reason was these people were so bogged down on the one perfect photo that they weren't out here exploring, trying new things, new techniques, different editing. Wow. Um, these people who got a hundred photos are like, well, I can, you know, I can be kind of crazy with this. I can take a risk here. I could do something out of the box because I got a hundred photos that I can do whatever with. It's limitless. It feels like, um, on how creative I can be. And so it was just interesting that, that the better photos were actually in the quantity because they kept doing it and they weren't afraid that I'm going to blow it if I have an ugly photo in here or not perfect photo. Um, so I just think of that, especially when creating, and again, this can be writing, this can be anything even that's not even a creative quote unquote thing that we do, that if we really just continue to explore and not afraid of blowing it or messing it up or doing it weird or whatever, we will stumble upon greatness that way. And it's because we're doing it without abandon, right? We're like, I'm just going to try this. I'm going to see how far it's going to go. Um, so I just, I love that story. I think that's wildly fascinating. That is really cool. The other thing I was thinking about is I had a friend um, say to me this week, he says, can we talk about your first book? And I said, yeah, I know what you're going to say. I need to write the next book on leadership. And he's like, no, this book you're writing, you're finishing right now, it's not your first book. You wrote a book seven, eight years ago on the anointing. And he said, but you never published it and got it out there. And he says, I think you should go back and relook at that. So if I went and found it and today I started reading it. And I was like, I got some good stuff in here, but I've learned a lot since then. I can rework this and I can produce this second book. So I was talking to my son today, and he's like, Dad, I do that with songs all the time. There were songs that I put out there. They were okay. But now, knowing what I know today, I can take that song and say, man, I should have done this. We could do this. And then you could put it back out there. I thought as a creative, and I don't really consider myself that much of a creative, but I was thinking that if you can, if you can put 100 photographs, you're going to learn some stuff. You've got a uh, hundred different angles to look at some different things. 
uh, you're going to be a better at editor. You're going to be better at spotting things. It's it's just repetition and doing the stuff. So I think the more you paint, the better you are at it. The more you sing, the better you are at it. The more you write, the better you're at it. So I, I think I wish we could do away with the perfectionism because it keeps us from putting stuff out there. And probably what we need more than anything else is to finish a project, sign our name to it, good, bad, or ugly, put it out there, and let the marketplace tell us where we did it well and where we need to fix it. So I have to ask, was mm-hmm. perfectionism something that kept you back from publishing that first book? Wow, probably so. It probably was back then. And um, yeah, that's a good point, Emily. I hadn't even thought about that. Way to mm-hmm. twist it and throw it back at me. Well. Um, <laughs> but it's fascinating that today I look at it and I was like, you'll, you'll appreciate this. The tone and the voice I used back then is not me anymore. Oh, I guarantee it. <laughs> and I was like, I can keep the content, but I've got to change some things because it sounds too religious. It sounds too, if you read it, you would understand and you'd say, I know that voice. And that's not me anymore. It's funny you say that because I actually had a memory on my Facebook and mm-hmm. it was like a quote that you had said during a sermon. And I yeah. was and I was like, oh my gosh, this sounds so harsh. <laughs> like he would never <laughs> talk like that yes, now. Like, it was so funny. Um, so I was like, wow, this doesn't even sound like Nick. Um, so it's very, very interesting. Um, so one thing I also want to bring up about perfectionism is it's boring. I don't want perfect. Like I used to, listen, I had the worst performance mentality um, growing up in musical theater and performing from the time I could talk, like I was on a stage. Um, But the perfection stuff is so boring. And I even, uh, the artists I follow now, the musicians I follow now, the comedians I follow now, like they're all so authentic and some of them are very goofy and out of the box and show their mistakes, show their flops. And it makes me love them so much more. Mm. And a lot of these creators or entertainers nowadays that are like very perfect all the time, like every time you see them, uh, like, okay, cool. I guess. I mean, if that's if that's your thing, is you look want to look perfect all the time, you want to perform perfect all the time. But the people that I really just am blown away by are those that aren't afraid to fail and aren't afraid to do something that isn't so linear. And so that's another thing for me. I just feel like perfectionism can be so boring. Yeah. <laughs> and and and. Some of the people we love the most are the people that take complicated things and they make them simple. They Mm -hmm. just make it every day like, hey, I could do that. No, you really can't, but they just make it look like that. (laughs) The other thing I was thinking about is I I I had a couple guys jump in my car last week and we were going to go to lunch together. And they're like, man, your car is so clean. Well, my car is never clean. It's empty. Okay. I haven't washed my car in forever. It needs to be detailed. It, it's, it smells like a gym bag probably, but it's clean. I, I pull out all the garbage, all my cups, anything that I've had in there. So when you go in there right now, you don't have to move anything. There's nothing in the front seat, back seat, everything's clean. But I started thinking about like, let's say that you're an empty nester and you don't care that much about how clean the house is as long as you can get around and do what you need to do. And then there's a different level of cleanliness when you invite your grown kids over for Christmas. You know, they're coming over, you're going to clean up a little bit, light a candle, you know, blah, blah, blah. And But then there's a whole different level of cleaning your house when Pamela Williams is going to come sell it, right? I mean, there's a Absolutely. whole different level. You better get that house clean. Yes. And I was thinking, what if our life was like that? What if it's like, you know what? I don't care if my shoes are laying in the floor. And I don't care if I, you know, clean a shower once a month. That's That works for me, just for me. Now, when the kids come over or my sister's coming in for three days, I'm going to clean the bathroom. I'm going to make sure everything's nice and pretty. I want to make sure. But then again, if Pamela's coming to sell the house, you go to a whole different level. 
What if our lives were like that, where we cut ourselves a break and say, you know, Pamela Williams is not coming over every day. So chill out, just chill out. So just some thoughts about that. Yeah, no, I think there's, there's definitely different levels where we feel like we have to perform or be perfect. Um, and I would start to ask who are the people that we feel like we have to be perfect around? Mm. Um, and why, what is, why do I feel this way? Why do I feel like I have to, um, be a certain way or change the way I talk or how I present myself or whatever. And, and of course there's time and place for everything. Like sure, we have, you know, I, I know when we're going, if I'm going to go meet the president, I'm not showing him sweats. Right. But there's even people in our lives. It's like, if my mom was to pull up right now and come into my house, am I going to freak out because my house is dirty and it should be this dirty? Or am I freaking out because my mom is going to criticize me, which my mom would not. What? Um, yeah. But I have a fr- I, I, I mentioned this on one podcast where like I have a friend who told her mom to stop coming to her house because every time she walked in, she started criticizing her. Um, so like what's the motive behind their perfectionism? Am I cleaning my house like a maniac because I don't, I'm living in fear of judgment or a disapproval from someone, or am I cleaning it? Cause you know, maybe you're just a tidy person. You love a clean house, but what are the motives behind our perfectionism? What is really driving that? Um, just taking a deeper look, it could be painful, but a lot of times there's a lot more there than just like, Oh, I'm a perfectionist. No, it's, I'm terrified that I'm going to fail and y'all are going to see that I'm a human. So we started by talking about artists. We didn't mean to, cause we don't, we just show up and start, you know, processing, <laughs> but we started with artists. But the question I have is in what areas do you feel like most people struggle with perfectionism? And I think it's with relationships. Oh, for sure. I think it's, I think it's probably not cleanliness. It's probably not makeup. It's probably not speaking. It's probably, mm-hmm. I would think most people struggle with perfectionism as it relates to the relationships because they, they respect the other person or they want their approval. What would you mm-hmm. think? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I see people with like employer boss relationship where if mm-hmm. they, let their boss down. Oh my gosh. Yep. Like end of the world. Yep. Like they, it's an unhealthy fear um, where it's not like a fear of reverence. No, no, no. Like they're terrified of their boss. Yeah. Um, or I mentioned the parent thing. Like you're so terrified to let your parents down. And I've definitely been there. Like I've always, and my siblings say the same thing. We've always desperately wanted to make our parents proud. And sure. so there's all kinds of stuff. And, and then it gets even on another level where, what is our projected perfectionism? For example, people who post a lot about a significant other and not saying that if you post about your significant other, it's you do you. But I know I've seen so many people who like paint this picture and show themselves on social media and like they're like, oh my gosh, I love my spouse. My spouse is perfect. And like two months later, they're divorced and you're like, wait a second. And it's because we have this also projected screen perfectionism that we're like, I need the world to see that this is perfect, that my family's perfect, that I'm perfect. And it's just boring and sterile or it's super unhealthy. And like either you've not really addressed what's going on or you are delusional. And so there's so many layers to like why we do it, but definitely the relationship one is a top one. We want approval from some, someone or we want people's approval, like from a public standpoint. Yeah. You remember the old redneck things? You might be a redneck if. You remember those jokes? Yes, yes. Well, you might be a perfectionist if you can't post a picture on social media without using a filter. I'm just saying, with the invention of the filters, I have somebody in my world I love dearly who is beautiful but I can't tell half the pictures if it's them or not because there's a new effect, a new filter. And I'm just like, quit messing with the filters and just be you. You're gorgeous ball by yourself. But yeah, that's really that you're probably a perfectionist if you can't post a picture without a filter. And I'm going to say this and I hope no one gets upset. 
Ladies, we have to stop using Snapchat filters and posting those pictures on Facebook or Instagram. We have to stop. Okay. That was all I needed to say. Um, because, <laughs> okay, I won't get into it, but like, yes, that is a thing. It's like, yeah, you're not going to look perfect 24 seven and it's okay. I remember, um, I think this is actually it was two years ago. I posted a selfie for the first time with like no makeup and no filters on. And I wrote a caption. I was like, I was so scared to post this. And it was like right when Adrian and I started dating and I was like, I don't, I just felt like I'd, I'd been locked in my house for two weeks with COVID. So I'd like sat with myself for a while. Um, so I was like, I think one of the things I need to do is like post a selfie without filters or without makeup, like the whole thing. And I remember I was like terrified and so many people were like, oh my gosh, Emily, this is like the most beautiful picture I've ever seen of you, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, what the heck? But it, it was a reminder that I don't have to be all done up or I don't have to have this beautiful lighting or whatever to be good enough. And that's the other thing with perfectionism. It's like, what is good, what is good enough? Is it when yeah. I love it? Is it when I get a hundred people to affirm me and my ego? And at that point it's like, eek, is that healthy? Mm, probably not. But I love Tina's answer that it's good enough and it's finished when I love it, when I approve of it. Um, and that takes a lot of work internally to be at peace with like myself and who I am. Yep. So at Christmas time, our organization does uh, something called Back to Bethlehem or Return to Back Bethlehem, forgive me. And it's a four day event, Thursday through Sunday, where we take over this whole church and there is like a 20 minute nativity scene where you go from like 15, 20 different stops of what it would have been like in on the streets of Jerusalem 2000 years ago when Jesus was born. It's, it's really quite a production, excellent. So we show up on the Wednesday night training or uh, before the Thursday uh, actual production. So we're an out, we're one day out. And they say, okay, by the way, you can't wear makeup. You can't wear perfume. You can't wear jewelry. You can't wear shoes. We're going back 2000 years. So don't wear deodorant. We're going we're to have livestock in there. And there's this group of women going, you want us to show up and not wear makeup? And we're, and we're like, yeah. And they're like, I, I don't, I don't know that I can do this. I, 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 I don't, I didn't know we couldn't wear makeup. And so they were really struggling to come and play a part in this production because they couldn't bring all the things that society tells them they need to, to, to use to be beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's so hard when you have to battle. It's, it is an uphill battle, especially when it's been years and years and years. Sure. Um, I mean, it's. It's like uh, somebody was asking, well, how long have you been doing makeup or whatever? And I was like, well, uh, probably like full face of makeup since I was like 15, 16 years old. So half mm -hmm. my life I've been yeah. putting makeup on almost every day of my life. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, I'm just now at the place in the last couple of years where I could go without it um, or or even a, or a lot, at least a lot less like. I just don't care about it as much. And I've really worked hard on accepting myself. Mm -hmm. And I've actually never publicly said what I'm about to say or share what I'm about to say. But I have really bad body dysmorphia. And it's like something that I've had to do therapy for and something that I battle with every single day. And I, I can stand and pick my body apart in like no time, like it, nobody would ever have to point out anything to me. Like I got it. I know it before you do. And it's been such a journey to learn how to love myself and accept my body. But then also, um, I don't know, just come to a place of healing. That's really at the end of the day, what it's about is like healing, um, internally as well. Um, and for those of you who don't know, if you're just listening, I have had my weight fluctuate really insanely due to 
cancer and trauma. So I've fluctuated honestly everywhere from like 70 pounds, which is a lot of weight to gain and lose, gain and lose. And so what I see in the mirror isn't what people actually see. And so I have to work really hard at battling any perfectionism. Cause I even think all the time, I'm like, okay, if I had this surgery and this surgery, then my body would be perfect. And I'm just like at the place now where every day I have to be like, no, I am enough. My body is awesome. It fights like heck. It beat cancer twice. Um, I have done so many incredible physical feats um, from like some insane hikes I've done, from backpacking, um, parts of the Appalachian Trail, like all this stuff. I have to remind myself of like how far I've come and say, that is enough. That is good. That is incredible. But it really is a battle, whether it is your body, your career, your relationships, like you have to work. If you've been in a perfectionist mindset at for any period of time in your life, it feels like there's always going to be that little voice of shame or rejection or judgment that's going to creep in. And you have to learn how to silence that thing. And I think the resounding thing that we always say is like, who are, who's in your corner too? Who's on your team speaking back to you? But at the end of the day, it really is my responsibility that I have to take ownership for that because I, again, I know my pain and I know myself better than anybody. So I have to be the one to say, all right, enough, enough, Emily. You have to love yourself. Wow. That's a lot of stuff right there. And I guess I would respond by saying um, it's a little shocking and a little stunning to me because, Emily, you're gorgeous. I mean, you're just gorgeous. And so for me, I'm saying, wow. I mean, I'm the guy that has to take photographs with you. And I'm like, I don't want to take a photograph with Emily. She's shiny and she's beautiful. But I will say this to you, though. Obviously, you see a flaw or two in your physical features that the lie can land on, the lie mm-hmm. can hold on to. But what you just said is the biggest challenge is not external, it's not physical, it's your it's your your internal mm-hmm. perception of yourself. And if there's just this little bit of evidence somewhere, it lands on that and grabs a hold of it. How much of perfectionism do you think is a lack of excellence, a lack of productivity, and how much of it is just terrible internal talk that's always looking for the negative. It's always that. Anybody who wants who wants to be perfect or is striving for excellence, it's I've never seen anyone that wasn't being excellent or doing all the things to get there. I think it's all internal it's all our mind. It's all that. It is never because somebody's like lazy or they're not trying hard enough or they don't care. People who are perfectionists care deeply, deeply mm. care. Like stay up all night thinking about all the different ways to do something or did I say that right or could I be doing more? That's the perfectionist mm, yeah, sure. problem. It's never, oh gosh, they're so lazy. A per- perfectionist. Their problem is never laziness or whatever um, in that category. It's always the the beating themselves up kind of thing, or they're doing way too much instead of focusing so, on like so, one thing. Sorry, go ahead. No, this is a fascinating question. We interrupt each other. That's what we do. That's what we so do. So who, who could tell you that you're beautiful and you would believe it? Um, so it's not, this is a very interesting question. And I've talked about this before on in therapy, haha. <laughs> but it's not Tell even, yeah, yeah, it's not who, because anyone can tell me that. And I, I am very blessed. I have very supportive people like yourself, Nick, and my my family, my boyfriend, my friends, like it's not a lack of hearing it or whatever. It is me loving me. It is my Mm -hmm. problem. And so it's not necessarily like someone if, oh God, if, you know, Adrian would just tell me 5,000 times a day how beautiful I am, then I would feel it. It's not that at all. It's me receiving it. 
that's yeah. the issue. Hmm. Yeah, because some couldn't a stranger come up to you and say, "Look, I'm married, not looking for, but you are beautiful. You're just stunning. You're gorgeous." blah, 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 and just walk away, that would mean a lot. Sometimes more than a loved one telling you 15 times today because you've heard it before from that loved one. And that loved one loves you and they're supposed to think you're pretty and all that. But I think it's interesting that you are limiting what compliments, and that everybody does this, Mm -hmm. you limit what compliments you'll receive. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. And I, like I said, the last two years have been wildly better, like Mm -hmm. just from all aspects, especially like self-love and self-confidence and, and all of that. But again, if I don't have, uh, the capacity to receive or acknowledge, um, then anyone could say that, you know what I'm saying? Like, it wouldn't matter if like the hottest celebrity said it, right. Um, it's cause I have to be able to receive it. And that, that goes for anything. And especially back on like the artist thing, you know, ask if whoever read my book and was like, this is the best book I've ever read, or this is the most beautiful piece of art I've ever seen. But you have to own that. You have to let that be like received into your heart um, or it'll just bounce off and you'll go back into battling. Well, I wish I would have used a little brighter shade of orange in that sunset, you know, or you'll just like critique it um, or or you'll do whatever. Um, so a lot of it, again, it's all about healing the internal part and like the self-awareness of where am I at? And I, I have to be the one to ultimately navigate. Like the, I am enough. I am good enough. I am X, Y, Z. My body is good enough, whatever it is. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's really that portion, I feel like. Yeah, and my question would be, where does the picture of perfection, where do we get that from? I mean, obviously, you have a picture in your mind mm-hmm. of people that you respect, women that you follow, whatever. Mm-hmm. But there's this, the picture comes from some place. One, is it attainable? Mm-hmm. And number two, I, I will never be four foot tall. You know, and I've got a guy in my life that is badass. I mean, he's just great, but he's like mad at God because he's not six foot tall. He's like, man, if I was six foot tall, I could compete with anybody. But now I'm a scrapper and um, and he's just he's never going to have that. Mm -hmm. So my question is, you know, when we ask when is enough enough, everything keeps coming back to you decide. Mm-hmm. And if you're unhealthy, if you're broken, if you're asking questions and you're needing your body to give you the answer or the crowd to praise you enough, it's probably never going to be enough. Right. The, the You have to decide what your version of perfect looks like and then stop when it's enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And go back and unpack all the stuff that kind of shaped that. So for me, even I've had to go back and be like, oh my gosh, I was a product of a child growing up in the 90s where it, like, that was when we had the cocaine models. Like, that was what they were. Like, you look at all the models and it was very trendy to be, like, real thin, like, unhealthy, unhealthy, very small. Um, And then also that was when, like, diet culture was going crazy. Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, all the things, like... And then we swing and we get the Kardashians who now, oh my gosh, women have curves. And now the Kardashians are now getting all their curves removed. And it's just, it's all this stuff that we start digesting and we think like this is perfection or this is what I should try to be. Um, And again, it goes back. I have to say, no, I, I, that's exhausting to try to keep up one with somebody who pays a lot of money to look like that. But also I am so blessed. There are so many people in my life. Like I, I am so, 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 so loved. Like I am so loved. And, um, there's actually a SZA song, which I know you don't know who SZA is, but she, there's like a line where she talks about how embarrassing it is that all this love that I need to feel validated. Like I'm embarrassed by that, but like, 
when you've went through so much and so many things have told you like you're not skinny enough or you're not smart enough, you're not this, you're too loud, you're whatever, and you constantly put yourself up against that, it's you need some kind of positive reinforcement and you need to be able to feel secure enough. And again, so much work has to go into unlearning all the BS, all the junk and getting yourself back in alignment with like, I was created beautiful. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I am smart. I am brilliant. Like, and that's where those like affirmations, I know a lot of people are like, oh, those are silly. No, if you get up every morning and you start like looking at yourself in the mirror and affirming yourself, and that can be anything male or female, men, don't be afraid to look at yourself in the mirror and talk. You'll be okay. But just even being like, I am strong. I am capable. I am wise. Like these things will shape your mindset and you will be able to hear that voice of shame, doubt, fear, and insecurity being smothered by that. And that's honestly what saved me is I had to like just squash that negative self-talk and just really turn up the mic on how blessed I was and how I am enough, period. So a couple of things as we wrap up. First of all, Emily Christopher just quoted scripture on this podcast. <laughs> I, I would just like to make mention that she busted she, into the Psalms on the yeah. fearfully and wonderfully made Halle. statement. Second of all, as I would like to say, that I think we got somewhere today. I mean, I think we talked about perfectionism and realized that there is no external amount of production that is going to satisfy your internal question. Mm-hmm. Until you solve your question internally, that you love yourself where you are. Mm-hmm. I, I know people who are loaded with money, but they're still chasing a dollar. Mm-hmm. They, they, they need another zero. If they could get another zero, they would feel successful and they could chill out. And it's a lie. When they mm-hmm. get to the next zero, they would feel just the same and they have to prove themselves all over again. You're never pretty enough. You never have enough money. You never have enough friends. You're never successful enough. So I think what we did today as we processed is we realized each one of us has to look at ourselves in the mirror and decide what's good enough for our for us. And it mm-hmm. might have a physical you know, demonstration. We might be overweight and we might say, you know what, I love myself, but I do need to get my health in check. I, I do love myself, but I need to write that book I've always wanted to write. Mm-hmm. I do love myself. I need some, you know, better friends, whatever. But it feels to me like we cannot answer that question externally. It has to be answered internally. Mm-hmm. And I think that we'll find out that there's not very many there's not very many people out there arguing with us about what's good enough for us. So we might as well make the decision and decide for ourselves. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Nick, thanks for creating space because I didn't realize I was going to get this vulnerable today. <laughs> Love it. (laughs) But I did. So, and thank you guys for being a part of this. I would love to hear feedback on this because I know there's got to be an area in your life where this has been a struggle. Um, I would love, love, love to hear stories or any, any kind of advice you would even give to someone who's battling uh, perfectionism. I would love to hear that as well. Um, please follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, like, and subscribe, follow us everywhere where a podcast or streamed. Uh, I want to shout out our producer, Adrian Vosch, our music, our theme music you hear is by Caleb Honorkamp. Any photography you see of Nick and I that is beautiful and professional, it was done by Allison Frost, also known as Before the Foundations Photography. All that is linked below if you'd like to check them out for more. We hope you guys have an incredible week, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.